Robert, thank you so much for accepting to give us an interview. We're very happy. The uh, TBLI group uh, is an inspiration for uh, and has been for quite some time. And uh, I have a few questions for you. I think our values are very aligned and we would like to go deeper into understanding what this means concretely for uh, corporations and maybe uh, s smaller enterprises. But the first okay. question I ask to all our participants is what does public value mean to you? Oh, um, uh, well, for, for me, it really means thinking of more than just yourself. Um, unfortunately, it seems that everyone is only concerned with themselves. It's, they don't care about anyone else. And you see it in the, the populist politicians in Europe and in America and Asia, who everyone just seems to do something that doesn't really benefit anyone other than themselves or a small group. I, when I do presentations, I use a very, uh, there was a TV show in the United States called The Wire, and it was about corruption and, drugs and education and media and politics and power. And there was one scene very important where he try, he was trying to get a, a district attorney to put pressure on someone to give information. And she got very upset because she embarrassed him. And all she cared about was how it's going to affect her career. And I think that was very telling. I think most people don't really do anything other than... Um, for their short-term interests. Uh, if we would have actually people, whether it's politicians or, or government or business or entrepreneurs who would think more about the collective, the commons, I think we'd be in a much better shape. Yes, of course, and the triple bottom line is about um, looking at the common interest while uh, keeping it as a possibility to grow. Uh, financially mm -hmm. as well and the UN has really developed this message uh, with the, uh, the SDGs and the trillions that uh, constitute growth opportunities. Um, so why do you think there's still approximately 90% of corporations that still do not embrace uh, this vision? Be because they're all in, uh, incentivized for short-term behavior. All of them, whether it's the financial sector, whether it's politicians who are only worried about the next election cycle, mm -hmm. whether it's entrepreneurs who are only worried about paying back their loan or their investment. So everyone is, all behavior is incentivized for short-term behavior. You know, I used to teach MBA students. All they cared about was learning tricks to get ahead of the line. Very few people <clears throat> want to dig the hole everybody wants to cut the ribbon mm -hmm. so that <laughs> short-term behavior is everywhere uh everywhere and it's you know we forgot about everything with smartphones is about instantaneous gratification we want everything super fast grab uber all of that is based on incentivizing short-term behavior and i, I and I, that's everywhere Yes. I, I focus mainly on the financial sector because they are also only incentivized for short-term behavior. If they were incentivized for long-term behavior, we would have a different financial system, but we don't. What's your main argument to convince them to look uh, at a longer term? Well, basically, it's in their financial interest. If you look at, um, if we take China's growth, whether mm -hmm. the, the figures are correct or incorrect, 6 to 8%, on average a year, that means China reaches US consumption levels in 2025, 2030, um, with an inefficient, until now, inefficient use of resources. So if we extrapolate that to all commodities, China might need 50, 60 million barrels of oil a day. They'll need most of the world's uh, grain, uh, wood, uh, coal, all commodities, they will need most of it. And then you add India and the other 3 billion in emerging markets and us, then you can see that this linear line growing, going up, which they all love, is not going to keep going up. It's not possible to have economic growth with a very wasteful use of resources because there won't be enough at that level of growth 
for everyone. So the opportunity is massive resource efficiency. So doing what we call factor 10 or 100, doing with one tenth or one hundredth of the resources to produce the same GDP and thus fuel economic growth. So that's an investment opportunity. That's a no brainer. And that is the big macro driver for, um, uh, for actually the financial sector. And I use that very, very, and they understand that they get that, you know, they get the investment opportunity. Um, and unfortunately the tax system, the bonus system, um, um, the, um, uh, the, the media system, all of that is kind of reinforcing this short-term uh, behavior. Everybody seems to want to die rich quickly, <laughs> as quickly as possible. And uh, that's just an educational issue. So our work has really been to educate the, uh, the financial sector and change the financial system by changing the mindset of investors. And when they see that it's in their interest, they'll do it. And until that time, they won't. Because there's no group as predictable as the financial sector. Yes. None. So it's, it's about behavior and mindset, yes. but it's also about policies, isn't it? Right, but I don't see anything coming out seriously on policy level. You know, you're, let's say uh, you're from France or, yes. or Romania. No, so you're, you're, you're running for mayor, uh, you're running for government in France and you say, vote for me. And by the way, we're gonna put a VAT excise tax on flying. So you're not gonna be able to go with EasyJet to uh, Bordeaux or to London for a third euro. You're gonna be paying 150 euro. And vote it, for me. It's actually, it's a, it's a good example because that's exactly what happened to the French government when they yeah. installed a, a tax, a carbon tax on exactly. Diesel. Yes, exactly. it, it created the yellow jacket. I mean, it's, it's the most horrendous situation. Why is it that if you buy a bicycle in France, there's 21 or 25 or 19% sales tax? I'm yeah. not sure the exact number. In the Netherlands, it's 21%. But if I yeah. buy an airplane ticket, there's no sales tax. Why? That's an agreement internationally. That has never changed and will never change because all of these politicians don't want to, they want to, you know, uh, run governments by um, consensus and decree. I'm sorry, sometimes you have to make difficult decisions. You know, you don't have a conversation with your theory. Well, let's discuss this and see what would be best for you. You know, why don't you get closer to the fire with your hands and let's see how that works out. No, sometimes you have to say, this is, I'm sorry, this is for the good. And maybe you won't get reelected for that but it's a question of leadership. There's no leadership. You know, the last true leader that we had that was working for the collective and the, 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 the public was Merkel. Mm. She's the last one. Yeah, and she lost. And she lost. Because of immigration, yes. Because oh, of immigration and or, you know, or other things. And I think it's important to uh, we have a, a, a similar populist Trump in the Netherlands now, Baudet, who's mm -hmm. saying exactly the same thing and climate change doesn't exist and that. And you don't get into an argument with people who, def who basically say climate change doesn't. You have to explain to them in their language, this is a tremendous investment opportunity for the corporates by being much more resource efficient, they will make more money. Mm. And so, so denying climate change is basically hurting your economy. So you're focusing on investors instead, where you yeah. think there are yeah. more hopes. Well, no, 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 because they're so predictable. You know, they, it's just a bunch of alpha males who run up the hill and off the cliff at the same time. So the behavioral change has never been tough. The hard part is access. People with a lot of money, like uh, Eno uh, and Ach no, don't have signs on the side of their building, hi, I have billions, come visit me. They're very isolated, so they only know what they already know. Uh, and because the wealth is concentrated in very few hands, I don't need to convince 
millions of people. When we started, we looked at who had all the money in 1997, 98. And the top 100 had direct or indirect control of about 20 to 25%. So I figured, oh, I only have to convince 100 guys at the time about CIOs about this. So it's manageable to do that. If you're trying to change the whole industrial base, you're talking of millions and millions of people. But if I turn off the spigot of money by convincing the financial sector, you know, you should only be investing in things that provide you a financial, social, environmental return and looking at the financial, social, environmental risk, then you have power and leverage. So doing, using that, using the power of finance as a means of leveraging um, the economic system, but I'm focused on the financial system. No, I hear you. You're talking about risks. Do you think the reputation of risk is still a powerful leverage? Mm, hard to manipulate because um, I, try, I looked at the three pressure points yes. to change the economic system, which were at the time and still are uh, finance personnel reputation. So I tried to teach students to MBA students about sustainable finance. It was at the, this was 10, 15 years ago. It's very disappointing because all they were worried about is their student loans. And I told them, if you want to change business, refuse to work for them when the recruiter comes to you and use the power of, that you have at that time. They want you, don't want to work for them because they don't align with your values. Very few of the students would do that at that time. Maybe they'll do it now. And it's they a very slow process. It's a slow process. You know, if you tell a recruiter, I'm sorry, your values don't align with mine and I'm not excited about the red BMW you're giving me, you, you will change behavior because that will go back to the board, particularly if it's a ranked MBA. Reputation, even for Greenpeace, is very, very, very hard to manipulate and change fundamentally um, and very complex and you need a lot of resources. I chose finance because I could do a lot with very little resources. Uh, I think reputation can help, but you know, uh, the Koch brothers have a terrible reputation. Have any, uh, have, is there a mass boycott of all of their products? No. Uh, Volkswagen? The Koch, Koch brothers in the United States. Yes, I hear you, but Volkswagen, for example, there was this huge diesel scandal. Yeah, okay, did it reduce the sales of Volkswagen? No. I mean, they, they turned it around. I mean, you, if you watch the documentary about how scandalous it was, you know, they were, it was almost, you, you thought of the concentration camps of Nazi that they were using to test <laughs> the vehicle. It was ridiculous. But did it really fundamentally change? No, because um, people in, in the end, they're pragmatic and they say, oh, I like Volkswagen, their cars are good, it's okay. All right, so there was a problem there. But are they fundamentally going to, you know, walk away from them? No, no. I mean, are people going to stop buying Unilever because it's all processed food, but they have a good uh, uh, reputation on trying to address climate change? No. So I'm not sure if reputation alone is going to do that. I think closing off the money flows is more powerful. Mm -hmm. And you can influence that more um, uh, quickly with, with few resources. That's what our focus is. Because we don't have a big organization. We just try to convince the, the irresponsible investors and criminals. I say that jokingly, but more the Donald Trump types. Because they have a lot of money, those people, yeah. and they're very pragmatic. They have a good sense of humor. Uh, the problem is the challenge is access, not convincing. A convincing is very, I'm used to convincing people. I mean, remember 25 years ago, there was no UNEP um, PRI. Yeah. There was no CDP. There was no EVPA. There was no EUROCIF. There was nothing. It was a barren wasteland. And we still were able to change behavior. Now that there's more infrastructure, we can really uh, get money flows happening. And I see it in Asia. 
four or five years ago when I went there, totally uninterested. Now, because they see the limits of pollution, now they're very interested in impact investing. Mm. It's also because they went way uh, <laughs> beyond the, sure. the maximum in uh, polluting their own space. Yeah. yeah. One well, could say they now invest into Africa and they pollute uh, the African uh, continent. Sure. Sure, but the, the investors in Asia that I met, mm -hmm. the big institutional investors, are very, very keen. They don't need so much convincing about ESG and impact investing. They're looking more for opportunities. Mm -hmm. And that's the, uh, Americans love to keep talking about how much they're doing on sustainable investment, impact investing and that. But it's, it's really, it's nonsensical. Because mm -hmm. if you look at the Montreal Pledge, which is the first agreement of uh, reporting on your carbon risk for all your investments. Yes. How many American institutions signed that? Nearly none. Nearly none. Not even Al Gore with his own fund manager signed this because uh, they will have to show how carbon intensive their investments are. You could be a, an SRI fund, but you could be carbon intensive. People don't understand that. Yes. So, um, I, uh, I, in spite of the challenges and difficulty and lots of rubbish being said, uh, I still focus on the financial sector because um, the concentration of wealth and influence uh, and also the next gen, which are going to be inheriting trillions of dollars, they're quite keen on um, aligning their investment with values. But, um, you know, as I said, whether it's politicians, corporates, students, investors, there are no angels. Mm -hmm. There are lots of heroes, but no angels. You know, uh, even though Warren Buffett gave money to the Giving Pledge, he still invests heavily into fossil fuels. Mm. So does it make him a bad guy? Mm. So I, I'm focused on investment, not on philanthropy. I don't think it's an efficient use of, of money because you're only using a per, small percentage of your money. So you focus on investment. Right. And you now offer opportunities rather than just uh, discussions. But you are yeah. very well known with your conferences, the TBL yeah. Uh, yeah. I conferences. So Correct. what I mean, the, the, conference is, the conference is just a tool. You know, we're, we're not doing the conference just to do conference. The conference is a tool to educate asset owners and managers and change behavior. They meet somebody who has more money than they do. They become interested because they look at the money flows. Um, <laughs> always focus on uh, self-interest, opportunity, and money flows. So we do that because you have to speak the language of the person you're trying to convince. Don't shout loudly in French to someone who speaks Chinese. So yeah. that's very important. And the conference is just one of the tools we use. We do retreats. We're doing one in Italy next week with a small group. We do learning journeys, investor salons, um, dinners, lunches. So everything in an intimate setting to get to people to go. To, yeah, to educate. Corporations, yeah, educate. investors, both? Mainly, I would say most of the people who come are investors. Some of the corporates that come uh, want to know what will investors be asking about them for their sustainable reporting. But we don't really target so much corporates. We target much more um, the uh, financial sector or those that are engaging with the financial sector. So it's more about convincing the, the large asset owners and managers. And unfortunately, it's, it's becoming easier and easier. Uh, it was harder 25 years ago, uh, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, but now it's becoming much, much um, easier. Uh, it's, I, I would call us more of a not for loss rather than, uh, you can try to be a for-profit, but there's no real serious uh, funding for these type of events in, in the way of sponsorship. So we try to do very high quality events with a small budget and we're quite successful at it. Uh, but the purpose is basically educate asset owners and managers about sustainable investment, liquid and illiquid. We, we found in our research that uh, responsible investors 
Well, also less than 10% of uh, the overall investors. Is it your, your finding as well? Well, it depends on what you what your definition is. I mean, if you use the, the GIN, the Global Impact Investing Network mm -hmm. definition, it's a very narrow definition mm -hmm. um, because the one sector that offers the ability for large investors to decarbonize portfolios is public transport infrastructure. That's a 2.3 trillion investment per year, $2,300 billion a year. When was the last time you spoke to anybody about impact investing and that they even considered public transport infrastructure? Yet yeah. it ticks every box. It's low to zero carbon, it's steady cash flow, no volatility, uh, high impact, no technology risk, scale. So we focus, that's a sector that's not even, you know, people don't even bother looking at that. Yeah. Or the secondary market of development finance. Uh, the exits of the the Proparcos and the CDCs and FMOs. It's another sector, low uh, fuel-free energy systems, which we prefer to call them renewable energy. There's no fuel costs involved. Another sector. So unfortunately, many people think that impact investing is, you know, it only represents this percentage or they over-exaggerate the size of the fund by in the liquid asset space. Mm -hmm. because their, their, their idea of impact investing is a smiling child in Tanzania drinking milk. Mm -hmm. That's an impact investment. Or a polar bear, that's an impact investment. But all of the things that I just mentioned, they don't consider impact investment. When actually, if you really want to change the, the economic system, you know, why are we building all of these, you know, these large roads and airports and, and subsidizing it heavily? Uh, and everybody starts complaining, oh, we're, so, we're subsidizing solar and wind so much when nuclear still gets almost all of the subsidies for energy when no insurance company will touch it. Hmm. It's a very inefficient use of, uh, of, of energy. So we focus, we speak in the pragmatic terms of changing the financial sector by showing large scale solutions for the finance. They need to speak, they need to think in zeros, many, many zeros, <laughs> billions and hundreds of billions. So basically you're telling us the market is absolutely huge and yeah. uh, well under, underused, underinvested. Totally, there's no infrastructure. There's, I mean, everybody says we can't find deals. Mm. There are no deals out there. So I say, well, where are you looking? If you're looking on Bloomberg, you're not going to find it. If you're looking yes. on Thomson Reuters, you're not going to find it. Um, and most investors are relatively lazy. They're not going in the jungle with a machete looking for deals other than a few people. So the lack of infrastructure to allow them to find there, there's hundreds of platforms of impact investing, but they're all what I call Craigslist. They're not well vetted, they're small, and they're all caves without doors. So there's one platform here, one platform there, one there, one there, maybe a hundred. As an investor, you are not going on a hundred different platforms of non-vetted deals. Yeah. And, and investors, particularly family offices, they actually like to know the person they're dealing with. That's one of the be good things about family offices and these institutional investors is um, algorithms are not going to be replacing the trusted intermediary or trusted advisor. Uh, that was not going away. And that's very, very important. They have to feel that everybody wants to sell them something, so they want to work with people they trust. Mm. Uh, and that's kind of old school, which I like, uh, taking the time to get to know someone. And they just don't have the time to go on all the platforms. So there's Lots of opportunities. There's not an infrastructure to easily find that. That's one of the other work that we do. We don't manage money, but we advise lots of investors on how to find what they're looking for uh, that's well vetted, good due diligence, that meets their criteria, that needs to, re that needs to invest quite a lot of money. So we do our work as many education and, and advisory, uh, but there's no shortage of deals. I always say, it, you know, if you say there's no, you can't find any deals, I say get out of the ghetto you're working in and go to another ghetto, go to another area. 
but they never do. They always stay in the same network of, of friends that they know and they all play tennis or golf or whatever sport or hobby they do with people who already think like them. So of course you're not gonna find something new and innovative and different. That's the same with pension funds. They never invest in uh, non-tier one. A tier one fund is like a KKR, a very well-established private equity fund. They never invest in non-tier one funds and they never invest in non-tier one funds that are not, that are doing anything innovative. Mm. The tier one funds are not doing anything innovative. They're just churning their wheels to write their commissions mm. and their, their carries. Um, so I like, I particularly like the family offices because they have a lot of money. They're just more discreet. You know, they don't publicize them. They don't have websites, but they can make quick decisions. And particularly the next gen are very, very keen on integrating sustainability in the way they manage their money. Mm. It's a generational thing, don't you? Don't you yeah. Yeah. It's, it's generational, but also education. Cause there's also a lot of people like Carrefour you know, big company. I met the family office from Carrefour a while ago who was kind of starting his way. Now I've, he's been doing so much, he's happy to talk about it. So he's coming to our conference to talk about it. And the ones that are really doing the most are talking the least. Hmm. And the ones that are doing the least are talking the most. And we see them over and over again. Yes, yeah. well. yeah. but, but like the, the CEO and one of the main shareholders of Keering, which was yeah. Pranta Redout. They, uh, they are a rock star in sustainable reporting, but how often does Pino go out and talk about this? Very little. The only publicity he got is because he made a big donation to Notre Dame. Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you look at what they did on a corporate level and speak to the people who are trying to really get all of the toxic behavior out of the company and actually report on their sustainable performance by deducting their environmental degradation, that's quite advanced. And they've been doing that for a while. So that's why I say m there are many, many uh, great people doing wonderful things, but they're busy doing it. They're not cutting ribbons. So they don't, you don't hear about them that much. And the media seems to cover the ones that write the press releases. Yes. or engage a PR person to go talk to them. Yes. Okay, these are the old uh, approaches, uh, still yeah. very alive. Oh, we're, absolutely. We're coming to an end to this conversation, fascinating conversation. Thank you, Robert. Is there any advice you would give uh, to corporations or investors who are not yet into uh, sustainable finance? Yes, uh, particularly the, the investors I would say that question the myths because everybody says impact investing is no profit, no good deals, there's no job, there's no opportunities, bad managers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's just, it's just a charity. Uh, but no one questions the myths that were perpetrated by the financial sector saying that private, our private equity fund gets 30% annual return, which is a joke. Most of them never do or hedge funds getting 30%. Most of them closed down because they weren't getting that. Or, a, or that or a, most fund managers always achieve their benchmark, which is also not true. Um, I was at FTSE and I heard everybody complaining, ESG data is not good enough. ESG data is not good enough. ESG data is not, over and over and over. So I got very upset. I said, you know, I've heard this for 25 years yeah. and none of you have ever said financial data is not good enough. We just went through a financial crisis, Madoff, Parmalat, Enron, WorldCom, China Hustle, and many, many others. And you've lost trillions of dollars because of fraudulent financial data. None of you ever said anything that, oh, the financial data has to be better. And there's never been a single company, never a single ESG reporting with fraudulent data that has led to the bankruptcy of a company, never. So my point is, look at the facts. Don't listen to Fox News or these types of populist rubbish. Look at your self-interest and opportunity. Do the math. The massive growth of emerging market is going to put more and more pressure of investing in things that do use much less resources, much less water, much less CO2, much better performance with, your, with HRM and your staff 
And if you do those things, you will have lower turnover, spend less money on hiring staff and people, you'll spend less money on energy, water, resources. So you will make more money. I mean, come on, it's not that complex. You are making it complex because you don't want to be confused with the facts. Mm -hmm. So just do the math, take a look uh, and listen. That's why so many people are interested all of a sudden. But the mistake made by many of the advisors, private banks, whether it's BNP Paribas or others, is they were talking in the wrong language. They were talking loudly in Hungarian to someone who spoke you know, Chinese. It's not going to work. You have to understand they're coming from, can I achieve my market rate returns? Am I looking at all of the risks? Who is doing this? What are the deal flows, et cetera? So, Focus on that, and then you'll get uh, the behavioral change. Thank you, Robert. I leave you to uh, your day that is starting uh, now. And I want to thank you deeply. That was really fascinating. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the time. I appreciate it. Stay well. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye -bye.